we're going to look into some literature now. Uh, during the early Meiji period, writers didn't really write. Okay, they were really focusing on translating Western novels into Japanese. Um, early Meiji period literature from the first half of the Meiji period, it's not really anything to write home about. Um, because novels, novelists were kind of experimenting. They were focusing on how to make their literature sound more Western. So they read a lot of Western literature, short stories, and then they made their Japanese literature Western style. So you have a lot of like science fiction type books. Jules Verne was very popular around the world in 80 days. He was very popular uh, at that time. So a lot of Japanese are translating Western books into Japanese. And if they are writing at all, it's almost like a copy of what was being written in the West at that time. One such example of this is uh, Tsubo Chishoyo. He was a great novelist, um, but his own novel, The Character of Present Day Students, it was um, about students in Tokyo University, which is where Tsubo Uchi went. He was an alumni of Tokyo Imperial University. Um, his own novel wasn't successful, but he did write a very famous book called The Essence of the Novel. And basically, this is a guide for aspiring writers in the Meiji period. And he talks about how a Japanese novel needs to be modeled upon a Western novel, must be realistic, no more you know, poems embedded in your stories, has to be written in colloquial, everyday language so that everybody understands, has to be real. You know, he, he wrote a great, great guidebook on how to write a novel that, makes, that sounds more Western, but his own novel wasn't that successful, which is interesting. Uh, in 1887, uh, Futabate Shime, he writes the first actually modern Japanese novel called The Drifting Cloud. It's a very real story about a government clerk in the Meiji period who becomes a failure at everything he does. He's depressed because he can't do anything right. Um, so this is a modern novel based on Western style prose, like a Charles Dickens type of work, very you know realistic. And again, Futabate models this based on what is being popular in the West at that time. Just like with literature, Meiji period poetry is also not really Japanese style poetry. It's based on Western style poetry, and sometimes it's just a translation of poems from the West. Okay, And a lot of writers at this time are very upset with what's going on. They criticize the Japanese obsession with translating Western works. Okay, Masaoka Shiki, for example, he's a poet. He said, I'm going to keep on writing traditional Japanese style poetry and literature. I don't care what the, what the majority of writers are doing. I want to write Japanese literature. Why are we copying the West for everything? So there is some criti criticism of uh, Meiji period, early Meiji period literature, um, which was just so similar to the Western style, and that's probably why it didn't do well. In the second half of the Meiji period, we'll learn more about um, some more writers who did do their own work, and they used their own brains, and they came up with excellent pieces of literature. We'll learn that in Lesson 10. Uh, architecture is interesting because during the Meiji period, for the first time, Western-style houses are built all over Japan to house the foreign residents and dignitaries who are living in Japan. So for the ambassadors, the consuls, for missionaries, they need to live in Western-style homes. So they were built for them. So you see a lot of Western-style houses come aboard in Japan. Uh, the Japanese people, despite all the things they converted in terms of Western clothing and dress and styles, they never really cared for the uh, Western-style houses. So you know that's one area where you don't see a Westernizing reform. Japanese people preferred their traditional style homes. Art is very interesting during the early Meiji period because Japanese artists completely abandoned traditional art. Tosa school, Kano school, this takes a little break. Okay, They now are obsessed with Western style art. So Kuroda Seiki is considered the founder of Japanese, um, J Japanized Western style art, in other words, Western style art in Japan. And during this early Meiji period, sadly, the Japanese t totally abandoned their traditional art. Okay, They replace it with Western style painting, which is still popular to this day. This is actually painted by a Japanese person in Japan for Japanese people. Okay, But you would think, if you saw this anywhere, you would think it's a German artist or a Dutch artist or a British artist. It's a Japanese artist, and this is supposed to hang in a Japanese home. So you can see how much the Japanese were obsessed with making their art as Western as possible. And if that wasn't enough, in 1876, the Meiji government actually invites two artists from Italy and the United States uh, to teach art in Japan, Western art, 
Okay. One was Antonio Fontenez, who was Italian, and the other was Ernest Fenollosa, who was American. Okay. So they were supposed to teach Western art to the Japanese. Uh, Fenollosa came to Japan, and he said, you know what? I'll teach you Western art, but he discovers Japanese art. And he says, what in the world are you people doing? He said, your art is so beautiful. Why are you getting our art if you have such beautiful art yourself? Why do we, you don't need our art. You have your own beautiful art. What's bad with yours? So he actually convinces the Japanese to appreciate their own traditional art once again. Okay? He says, well, you don't need our art. You have your own that's very beautiful. So because of this and because of you know, this slight rebound on Westernization in the 1890s, many Japanese came to look at Western art with disgust. They said, we don't like it. Um, Okakura Tenshin, he was actually a student of Fenolosa. He forms a society for the appreciation of painting. And he convinces the Meiji government to say, you know what, instead of funding this copy plagiarism of Western art, why don't you guys continue supporting Japanese-style painting? So thanks to Fenolosa, uh, Japanese and Western art was able to coexist. Okay? Uh, Japanese art doesn't disappear. It's brought back. Uh, some artists focus on Western art, some artists focus on Japanese art. So, you know, it, it coexists, the best of both worlds. Woodblock printing doesn't go away either. In fact, woodblock printing is heavily used in the Meiji period to depict historical events. So, like, the signing of the Meiji Constitution, uh, the opening up of the country when the black ships arrived. These historical events are all depicted in um, woodblock prints, which are then published in the newspapers. They can be rapidly copied, right? Or distributed to the people. This is, for example, an image of Emperor Meiji and his family in the garden, in the Imperial Palace. You can see that Emperor Meiji and his entire family are wearing Western-style clothes. This is the extent of Westernization. If the Imperial family is doing it, you know that it's a national effort to modernize and Westernize. Music. Uh, the first Western music is heard in Japan when Perry's naval band, Commodore Perry's uh, naval band, they played music on the black ships when they first docked in Edo in 1853. So that was the first time the Japanese heard Western-style music. And when they developed their imperial army and navy in the 1870s and 1880s, the Japanese developed Western-style marching or military music, which is very, very heavily based on the Prussian, the German music, military music of that period. That's developed as well. You also have ballroom dancing uh, developed during the Meiji period because people knew that this is what Westerners did to pass time. So uh, a certain hall was constructed in Tokyo in 1883 called the Rokumeikan, and this was a beautiful facility that was like a banquet hall for holding parties, not only for foreign dignitaries from other countries, like if a president or a prime minister from another country arrived, they would be housed in the Rokumeikan, but they also held parties there for the political elite, for the Meiji oligarchs, right? There was always ballroom dancing there. This is an image of a Japanese ballroom dancing party hosted by the Empress. And you can see everybody is wearing, you know, the Victorian style Western garb of the day. Izawa Shuji introduces Western songs and melodies in the Japanese public school system. In other words, Japanese kids now have to sing um, songs, Western style. And in Christian churches and schools, Christian hymns were also sung. Of course, these are all with the Western melodies, but the lyrics are all in Japanese. So when I say Western songs and melodies, they're melodies you might have heard, but the lyrics themselves are, of course, Japanese. And any country needs a flag and a national anthem. Japan didn't have these things because they were isolated for so long, but in the 1870s, you need a flag, right? Because you want to join the, the, the list of the other nations. So in the 1870s, the Japanese flag and national anthem were adopted. The national anthem is called Kimigayo or His Majesty's Reign. And I'll put a video up on uh, Canvas for you to listen. The Japanese uh, national anthem, the music was actually written by a German musician. He did the music. But the lyrics are interesting because the lyrics came from a waka poem back in, written in the, in the Kokinshu from the Heian period. Remember the Kokinshu? So it made a comeback. They used a waka poem from the Kokinshu to supply the lyrics to the national anthem where a German music, musician did the, um, 
adapted the music. So it's like a marriage of what Japan was in the Meiji period. Some Japanese things and some Western things. The music was Western in this case, and the lyrics were Japanese. So it's like a hybrid. And the national flag is, as you see, it's called the Hinomaru, right? The rising sun. The first flag, by the way, there was the... Uh, that's the actual flag. And the second flag on the bottom, that was the flag of the Japanese army and navy. So that was the army's flag. And then the one without all the red lines was the, um, the national flag. No and bunraku really declined in popularity during the Meiji period. Uh, they're just not as popular anymore. Kabuki, though, doesn't go anywhere, right? So I think that shows something about kabuki has a very timeless nature. A brand new kabuki theater was constructed in 1872 in Tokyo. And the, one of the reasons kabuki was able to survive is because it was timeless. The, the plays were modernized to talk about more modern ideas, current fads, current issues. So it was very relevant, which is why kabuki never declined in popularity like no and bunraku did. A new type of performing art was developed uh, during this period called shimpa. And shimpa is basically Western-style theater. So you have performers on stage having a story. There's a plot, different characters, costume changes, etc. There's no masks. There's no music. There's no running around. It's basically Western-style theater. So that becomes very popular in the Meiji period. And the themes of shimpa were often political. So you would talk about the plight of farmers in the countryside or this young student who's an activist against the government and gets arrested because of the government's limitations on human rights and free speech. So oftentimes playwrights of Shimpa would get in quite a bit of trouble because their themes were a little too controversial for the new government. <laughs> 